actions of repeated measure ANOVA. You know, in any statistical findings, we actually consider all, all models, all statistical models have errors. We should call there's always going to be a place of unexplained variation. We always want to minimize unexplained variation. We know that our model cannot capture reality, exact reality, because of the fact that our models are not perfect. Therefore, all assumptions in the model revolve around the residual, around the error. And we can only trust our model if the residual behaves well, if error behaves well. And that's why we need to check for assumptions. Another objective today is uh, we want, we're going to consider different variance covariance structure. Which one is appropriate? Should I go for unstructured? Should I go for autoregressive of order one? Or should I go for compound symmetric? Okay, that is, I provided a lot of code here. Question F in assignment eight, bonus of three points. Okay, you're actually going to compare your, you know, those three different variance, covariance, uh, metric. But it's not compulsory that you should do it. You got nothing to lose. But if you want to, if you want to grab extra credits of three points, I provided that opportunity now. Now, I need to I need to take a look at what I'm showing on the board. We want to assess modal assumptions. If we want to uh, uh, assess modal assumptions, what are the assumptions in a repeated measure? Okay, the assumptions in a repeated measure depends on whether you're focusing on random intercept only or, or random intercept and random slow. I'm going to say that again. Assumptions in repeated measures ANOVA depends on whether you are trying to focus on random intercept only or you're focusing on random intercept and random slope. If you are focusing on random intercept only, then the assumptions is going to be the normality of the random intercept, the normality of the residual, and the constant variance. I'm going to say that again. If you're focusing on random intercept module, okay, random intercept module, it is only intercept that is random, then the assumption is going to be the random intercept has to follow normal distribution. Okay. Then the residual also need to follow normal distribution. Then constant variance. Now, the, the metric structure, the covariance metric structure we've been using, all this why. I wanted to look at what, what do you see in the diagonal? Can, somebody, can you see in the diagonal of that compound symmetric matrix? That's a constant variance. Is that not a constant variance? What, 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 is, what is that? That is the variance of the system. The variance of the response variable here. Here I'm assuming what? What am I assuming? A random intercept. Why? Because the sigma square B, okay, is the variance of the random intercept. Then the sigma square is the variance of residual. I wanted to take a look at this now. So here now, I'm using a compound symmetric matrix. If you look at the off diagonal, what do you, what do you see in the off diagonal? Sigma square B. Okay, the sigma square B is what you see in the off diagonal. That is what I'm going to call the covariance in a random meta set model. Now, this is the model I've presented. Now, if I want to talk about the random intercept and random slope, then it means my absorption will be extended because I have two random effects. Random intercept, random slope, 
the random intercept must follow normal distribution. The random slope must follow normal distribution. The residual must follow normal distribution. We must also have a constant variance. That is what assumptions here is talking about for random intercept and random slope. We got two random, two effects that are random. Slope is random. Intercept is random. Each of them must follow normal distribution. Not only that, residual must also follow normal distribution, making three, right? The fourth one, constant variance, making four. Take a look at that. We got four as options for random intercept and random slope model, but we got only three for random intercept only. Now, this is a coding now. I'm, I'm actually going back to the de dental data example we've been using. Okay, now you know we've worked with a lot of models under the random intercept, right? For dental data, the final model we choose is this guy. Look at model one. The final model we choose is the one that has to do with interaction. You know, there was another model for random intercept for this particular data that was that, that only focused on main effects the main effect of age plus the main effect of gender, right? And in the, in, the, in the previous lecture we've done, we've chosen this guy to be the final model among the random intercept model using the ANOVA, I mean, nested ANOVA test. The nested ANOVA test I will call the LRT. Now, let me tell you this. It is the, if you want to conduct, if you want to check, whether assumptions are violated or not. You can only check that on your choosing best model. Does that make sense? Okay, and that's what I'm doing here. These are the code. Oh my God, take a look at this now. I'm talking about random meters. This is a kiki plot, right? What does kiki plot does? The kiki plot will enable us to know whether normality has option old. Now, uh, the normality assumption for the random intercept, the normality assumption for the residual. And that's why you saw you are seeing the two QQ plots on the board now. What about the one for cost and variance? Is this guy here? That's a residual plot. Now, uh, that is how to investigate for the random intercept model based on the final model we choose when we run series of random intercept model for the de uh, dental data. You know, I also walk you through a sleep data, right? Last week. Now, what, what was it under the, under the random intercept and random slope? What was the final model we choose? Don't forget, we actually choose the, if you take a look at the final model, we choose the one for uncorrelated. Why? You know, remember last week we compare two form of random intercept and random slope model. What are the two forms of random intercept and slope model? The two form is one, a model where the two random effects are uncorrelated and, the, and another one where the two random effects are correlated. The one where they are uncorrelated was the one we introduced zero. If you remember uncorrelated now, that's why you see zero here. That was the one we chose last week. We compare the uncorrelated one with the correlated one and using the uh, likelihood ratio test, okay, powered by our nested ANOVA test, we choose this guy, okay? This is the final model. If I now want to investigate whether absorption hold, I will only investigate that on my final model. Now I want to investigate Assumptions of normality, normality of what? I'm going to investigate assumptions of normality of the random effect, assumptions of normality of the, uh, you know, I mean, random slope and that of the random intercept. That is exactly what you see me doing now. This is for the, you can see that, you can see uh, the code that I wrote and take a look at that. Random intercept, I have that. Random slope, I have that. Then I'm going to have another one, which is going to be for a seed or Look at that. This is for a CDO, huh? Okay. Any question? 
I mean, uh, yeah, this is going to be the normality, the Kiki profile, etc. So whatever model you choose as your best model, that is what you're going to investigate, whether as option old. Why am I disturbing myself? Investigating whether absorption hold in a model that is not the best. And that is why we need to wait until the final model has already been chosen before we can now investigate whether absorption hold. Let me tell you this. If somebody commits an offense in the state of Minnesota and the person is being tried, any court can establish the fact that he commit the offense if, if if the person truly commit the offense any court outside state of minnesota whether california um uh, wisconsin michigan and so on they can establish that fact i'm seeing a uh, state of um, minnesota and other states are different kind of models but let me tell you this the facts remain since he commit the offense in the state of Minnesota, even though if other states were able to establish that fact that he commit the offense, whatever decision they take will be null and void because other states do not have a territorial jurisdiction. What am I trying to say? Even if you conduct an investigation, absorption, investigation, on a model that is not the best, even if as option old, <laughs> even if as option old, you cannot see trust that model because it is not the best, because it does not have a territorial jurisdiction, just like the scenario that I described. And that is the reason why, when we have competing models, we need to for of us use our statistical technique to arrive at the final module. Then the final module we arrive at, then that is where we're now going to investigate whether as option old or not. Now I want to go into the second objective of today. And I want you to listen here. Because if you understand this, what I want to do now, you'll be able to understand how to solve problem 1F. That is a bonus. Extra credit. It's worth extra, extra credit of three points. But let me tell you this, I'm not imposing that on you. If you don't want to go, if you want to go for that, you can just attend question 1A to E. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I want to talk about covariance structure. In statistical analysis, the covariance structure is that we actually adopt for our study. Play a very huge role in how reliable, you know, uh, what, what we get, the result at the end of the day. Now, we, have, we got three types of covariance structure. Number one is what we call a, the uh, compound symmetric structure. Okay, this, are, this is a compound symmetric structure. Do you know what this compound symmetric structure is trying to say? It's trying to say, the variances is constant all the time across. Now, this is basically not going to be true uh, in a situation where the variances are not constant. Okay? So you're actually going to see that this is what we've been using. We're using this on the assumption that the variances is constant. And why do we think so? When I use different uh, uh, subjects for, when I use the same subject for different, uh, when I subject, when I subject uh, the same individual to different conditions, when I subject uh, individual to different experimental condition, okay? Now, if I have this, what you're actually going to have in the diagonal will represent the variant. Maybe this one is the variance of the force. Maybe this is for the same subject. Okay, a subject having this variance covariance. The diagonal matrix is going to be variances 
and each variance will represent the variance of each experimental condition. I'm going to say that again. We are subjecting this guy to, uh, to different experimental conditions. The variances in the diagonal, each variances represent the variance of each experimental condition. The covariances is how the measures are related, how the conditions, you know, how they are related. Because it's the same subject, the variances here are likely going to be equal, very equal. That's what we are assuming this guy. That occur in a repeated measure. But we have another variance that we call unstructured. The unstructured is the one that we be that you know about. The unstructured is the one we use in constructing principal component. You know that covariance? Do you know that covariance? The one we compute from the data. The one we're going to compute from the data. Let me even show you here. Do you see this guy? This is unstructured. Okay. The unstructured uh, correlation, this is the one that we use, that we always use. Okay. Of course, we don't expect uh, the diagonal to have the same variances. But when you standardize that, you know that we have one, 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 right? This is a correlation from such. Variance covariance. This is actually saying we are computing this from data. Even though this makes sense, but this is going to use a lot of degree of freedom. I'm going to say that again. This is going to use a lot of degree of freedom. We always use this when we realize that there is no justification to assume equal variances. Okay? That is when we make use of this guy. Now, the last one is autoregressive of other one. You know, when I say autoregressive of other one, in time series analysis, you know, the subject, because we're working with the time series data, individual were visited more than one time. Okay, now, if I have week one, week, uh, week, uh, week one, if I have week one, two, three, four. When I say autoregressive module of order one, I mean uh, phi one, yt minus one. You know what this guy is trying to tell me? I can relate. For instance, let's say this is week, if this is week two, and this is week one, okay? I can relate week, week two with week one. The correlation between week two and week one, week two and week one, they are one distance apart, okay? Between week two and week one, week three and week four, between two time uh, points that are one distance apart, the, the relationship is gonna be row. It's going to be correlation. It's going to be this guy. But what if, if I want to do with two, with three, if I want to, if I'm talking about those that are, you know, two apart, two apart, two uh, lag apart, it's going to be row squared, row squared. Three apart, it's going to be row raised to power three. Any question? Now, which of the row will be, will be the smallest? Can somebody tell me? Row, row square, row raised to power three. And don't forget, if, it is, if row equal to one, that will be perfect. We can talk about perfect of diagonal. What we're going to have that of diagonal is going to be less than one. You expect this to be the smallest. Row raised to power three will be the smallest, which means the response that I give, that I gave, when I was, you remember the data set we were using the other time, age 10, age 8, 10, 12, 14. The response that I give when I was age 8, 
And the response that I gave when I was age 12, the, the, the relationship between them would be very, very small. Does that make sense to you? But the response that I gave when I was age 8 and age 10, because they are very close, the, the role would be very high. That is the meaning of AR1 structure. You can see the three different kinds of structure that we have now. The one we've been using, we've been using compound symmetric structure. The compound symmetric is assumed when there's a justification that is a cost and variance. Then the unstructured is actually used. Unstructured is the one we're used to, it's the variance covariance that we are used to, the one we normally compute from the data. Okay, but the autoregressive of order one, you are now putting into consideration. Why do we say autoregressive? Okay, you want to link the current to past, to the past. And the relationship between those who are lag one apart is what you see on the board that is a row. Two lag apart, row square. Three lag apart, row raised to power three. Now I'm going to show you the code now. What I expect in the, in the assignment, uh, the bonus is this. If you really want to start uh, that, uh, I'm going to, now when you, another thing I'm going to tell you when you're talking about uh, looking at uh, the structure, we, there are two packages that we can also compare, the LME out and the LME, okay? So you can see on the board here, I'm trying to compare them, okay? Uh, which of the approach uh, is great. So, but I'm gonna quickly, and if I want to know which of the approach is great, I will choose the one with the lower AIC. So now let me go to the structure that I talk about. If I want to run a compound symmetry, I need to listen now for those of you who want to grab three extra credit points in the current assignment. Look at the code, compound symmetry. Okay, here I'm using this compound symmetry for random intercept. Do you see that? Okay, distance on age, right? That is what I'm going to write. Okay, this is the result that I'm actually going to get for compound symmetry. How am I going to know if I want to compare the compound symmetry with a structure and with the autoregressive structure, I will compare the AIC. Can somebody cite that AIC 151.2183? The one with the smallest AIC would be the best covariance structure. Now, this is a code if you want to uh, actually use a uh, compound symmetry. Now, what about if I want to use, uh, and of course, uh, this is the, uh, the, you know, the correlation matrix. If I don't want to use, if I want to use AR1 that I just uh, explained here, the autoregressive module of that one, and I'm still using that on the same random intercept, on the same module, except that there are different error structure. I mean, I mean the covariance structure. Now, this is the code for the AR1. You see correlation equal to core AR1. What AIC do I get here? 149.3976. What is it telling me? For that particular module, AR1 is better for now because what we, what we got in the AIC of the other one was actually 151.2183. The, but the model with the lowest AIC will be the, the best. Now let's look at, now we've seen what the AR1 give us. Let's see what the unstructure will give us. For unstructure, what is the code? Look at the code. Correlation equal to core, C-O-R, X-Y-M-M. Look at that. I'm still using this for what? Random intercepts. What is the AIC? 
Oh my God, 156.4946 out of this structure, which one is the best? The one with the lowest AIC. The one that we're actually going to see, that we're actually going to choose, is the, uh, I think it's going to be AR1. Yeah, the AR1 is 149.39. Take a look at that. I provided you the code here. So for those of you who want to grab, you know, the three extra credit points. Okay. Now I've already, now look at this question. Which variance covariance to use? We have factors to determine that. We use parsimony. Parsimony is, okay, the one whose model are few numbers of parameters. Let's say, for instance, now, uh, we have two modules that are the best. Maybe the first one is a random intercept module. And the second one is random intercept and random slope. If I use a different uh, covariance structure on them, then I will actually go for the one the, uh, with the fewer numbers of parameters, which is likely going to be the one for the random intercept only. But the most important thing that we normally choose, that we normally use, is the AIC. Uh, I think uh, Fit, uh, Fit Morris 2011 uh, does not recommend the use of BIC for covariance uh, model selection. But, uh, but on that, you know, what we what we actually what we want to use is the AIC, the one with the smallest AIC, the variance covariance structure with the smallest AIC is going to be uh, the preferred, the one we can, we're actually going to use. Today, I've uh, actually walked you through assumptions uh, with a period measure. I walk you through how to investigate assumption for random intercept only. And I also do that for the random intercept and um, random slope. And not only that, I walk you through different covariance structure. Because when you are using the wrong covariance structure, you're actually going to mislead. I walk you through the first covariance structure. It's what we call compound symmetry. The compound symmetry assume equal variances. We have a way to investigate that. The second error, uh, you know, the covariance structure is autoregressive module of other one. We are is trying to say the correlation between one lag apart is going to be rho, two lag apart is going to be rho squared, three lag apart is going to be rho raised to power three, and so on like that. Then we have the unstructured one that we always use. The unstructured one. We are safe with the unstructured one, but the, it comes with a cost because you're actually going to use so many degrees of freedom. Imagine if you have a constant variance and you have a 10 by 10 matrix. If you have a 10 by 10, you only need to compute one variance and one covariance. And that one variance will be repeated. You're going to be assumed that the remaining 10, and that is why we, uh, at times we choose the compound symmetric matrix but you shouldn't choose a model because of its simplicity and you shouldn't choose a model because of its complexity. So this is going to be the end of a repeated measure ANOVA. It means out of the three topics that will be covered in the final exam, we've already done two. What are the two? Number one, the principal component analysis. Number two, the repeated measure. Number three is what we're going to start on Wednesday, which is going to be the last topic of the semester. We're going to start that on Wednesday and we're going to go all the way probably to next week that we call logistic regression. I'm going to prepare your mind about logistic regression. Every, you know, the nature of the response variable we've been dealing with in this class has been continuous. What of in a situation where the response variable is categorical or it is a count, 
if it's a categorical, then I, I can't use anything, anything that has to do with linear regression anymore. I have to go for logistic regression. And if it is a count, then I'll go for Poisson regression. So those are the combination of what we're going to do starting from Wednesday. Any question before I go today? Go ahead. That's a very, very good question. You know what I needed to do? Send me a message for extra credit for asking intelligent questions. You know, uh, you, if I hear you clearly, you said we need to test which your uh, error structure is appropriate, right? Before, before we do what? Do, do we need to fall for so uh, you know investigate absorption before we decide on which uh, error structure work? Yes. You know, do you know what is going to make us to think of going for error structure? Maybe the assumptions of variance have been violated. <laughs> Does that make sense to you now? Because part of the assumption you are testing is testing for the quality of variance. If the quality of the variance assumption hold, you know what happened? When the quality of the variance assumption will go with the compound symmetric. But what if it doesn't hold? If it doesn't hold, it's either it's going to be AR1 or the unstructure. How do I know which one I can compute all of that? Then compare the AIC. That's a, That's an intelligent question. Okay, don't forget.